Okay. Welcome back, everybody, for our second lecture today on church and ministry administration. Let me just uh, going through the and the formation of the legal entity and what that involves and so on. Uh, let me just share again the notes and we'll continue using that. Right. So what we said so far is, you know, we went through, okay, what are the articles of incorporation or the trustee, as we call it here in India, are basically it's a document that states what the organization will be doing, church or ministry, and that is registered with the government. Um, and it's a legal document in the sense that uh, the organization will be held responsible to follow the articles of incorporation. Uh, the articles of incorporation will also include the roles and responsibilities of the directors, uh, what they're supposed to do, what they can and cannot do, um, their privileges, their rights, in order to run the organization. All of that is stated in the Articles of Incorporation. Um, now, the moment you form a legal entity, what we were saying was uh, we need to follow what are the requirements, the statutory requirements by the government. So, for example, uh, and I was just mentioning some examples, um, for us here as a church, uh, we have tax exempt status in the sense that we don't pay tax on money that is given to the organization. So when we register, uh, we also register as a we registered as a religious organization, and we register uh, in a particular category called 12A. So that means uh, we get tax benefit that we don't pay tax on our income. So most corporations, uh, businesses, they have to pay tax on their income. So typical whatever percentage or some person, we go maybe 30 percent, we go to the government on their income. But because we are registered as a religious organization with this particular 12A registration, uh, the government exempts us from paying tax on our income. So all the contributions that people give to us, we don't pay tax on it. So that's a benefit the government gives for us. But there is no benefit to the donor. So the donor does not get a tax benefit on their income tax just because they contribute to a religious organization. Whereas in the United States, it's different. In the US, both benefit. That means in the, in the, in the United States, if you are a, a religious nonprofit, they call it a 501c3 organization, then the person giving money to the religious nonprofit, they get tax benefit for the amount they give. So if they give $1,000 or $10,000, that $10,000 they can deduct from part of being taxed in the total income. So they get the benefit. Plus, the religious organization that receives the donation doesn't pay tax on their income. So both sides get benefits. In India, it's not like that. In India, the donor, no matter how much money they give to the organization, that amount is still considered taxable for them. They still have to pay tax on it. They don't get a tax benefit. The only benefit is on the receiving side, that is the organization, the religious organization that receives the money. We as a religious organization, we don't pay tax on our income. But there are other statutory requirements. That means if we are having staff and we are paying the staff, we have to deduct the uh, tax on the income we give to them based on the government regulation. And that tax we give to the, they have to pay to the government. So there is the professional tax for consultants or there is the income tax for staff. So that we have to deduct according to the labor laws and we have to give. So that is something we have to follow. Secondly, uh, the retirement fund. So 
uh, that is also part of the labor law. That is, if you are having staff, people are working for the organization, you have you the organization has to contribute money to their retirement fund. Here it's called provident PF. So it is a law. So we have to follow the law. That means we have to deduct money from their what their salary. Plus we have to add money to that, and then we have to put it into their retirement account. So if we have 30 people, for all the 30 people, we have to do this. Okay. So these are laws we have to follow, uh, uh, which is part of uh, running an organization. Right? Um, but I said, like we said earlier, the accountant will handle all this for you. So we are not personally, you know, pastors, we're not sitting and doing all these calculations. It's the accountant uh, and the chartered accountant firm that handles all this for us. Plus, every year we have to file our audited statements. That means this is the money that is coming in, this is what we have done with all the money. All the report is filed with the government. So, government knows what this organization is doing. If we don't file, that is when they will come and start investigating. So, every quarter and every year, we file our reports with the government. This is how much contributions have come in. This is what is happening with the money. This is where the money is going. So the government is happy. And they check everything. But this organization is following what they are supposed to do. But if any suspicious activity they see, they have a right to ask questions. They will send a letter. Please come and explain what is this. So that that is how you know that will happen if the officers in the government they see any suspicious activity they'll ask questions and if you don't file our papers with the government every year they will definitely come and you know they call it a raid they come and investigate what are you doing so so it is better that we follow these rules right and then from a management side the law is that we should have regular meetings. The, the trustees, the directors, they should have regular meetings. They should record their meetings, right? So that's part of what we do. Right? So we meet, we record it. This is what we have done. Now, till now the government has not asked to see those things, but technically they can, they can. But till now, you know, last 20 years, 20 some years, Nobody has come and checked. Uh, show us your record is all. But we are maintaining our records. Uh, okay, we have, of course, today a lot of emails, communications, automatically recorded. Uh, but we have meetings, discussions, and then we record in the book. This is what we've dis decided. So, okay. so these are some obligations that we have to follow to operate legally in any country. So, now. I'm moving to another very important part of, which is called advisory board. Now, an advisory board is not a legal requirement. Okay, it's not. Uh, so to run the organization, all you need are the office bearers, the, what do you call as trustees, or the people, or the, it could be three people, it could be four, it could be five, it could be seven, any time. So right now, we have five people. So legally, that's all we need. Okay. But what most organizations do as a good practice, and what we also uh, are following, uh, is we have an advisory board, meaning uh, we have a set of people that we can go to for advice. These people are not involved in the direct running of the organization. They don't interfere with what we are doing day to day. So day to day things, we are actually, it is basically the pastors and the staff, they are doing the day to day work. Main decisions, the trustees will do. If we need special inputs, some more discuss. Then we will go to these people who are in the advisory boards. So they are people whom we go to for advice. 
Okay, so they are not they are not involved in the day to day things. They are legally not part of the organization. They are just people who can give some advice. So they call advisory boards. Now, what we have is again, uh, uh, you can create, set up this advisory board any way you want, right? That means basically you're selecting some people, saying I'll go to these people for advice if I need. It. So. Uh, the, the trustees, like uh, I mentioned here on page 10, the trustees, they are the people who are responsible for the organization. So they are the ones who uh, must make sure everything is running, the directors or the trustees. They have to make sure everything is running properly. The advisory board, the way we set it up, and uh, is that we... Again, this is just how we are operating. I'm not saying everybody should do this. But what we decided was we'll have some people from within our church or, the, or congregation who are, who are experts in certain areas. And we will go to them as and when we need advice on certain matters. If we cannot find people from within the church, then we will have people from outside as advisors so we we identified eight areas one is legal so somebody who knows the law right especially law concerning how to run a religious trust so legal then accounting so we already have our own accounting people who are doing the work but if you want additional like, advice somebody that we can go to then organization development how can how to build the organization in case we need to how do we structure people organization things uh, missions and social work somebody who can give us input on that uh, technology operations media uh, current trends counseling so, so these are the eight areas okay and we also try to have a balance in age. So some areas we need more mature people. Some areas we need people who are young and who are in current, who are in touch with the current trends and so on. So we want to have a balance of both sides, right? We need balance of experience. We also need balance of a fresh input and so on. So we have these people, but they don't come to you know regular meetings or they don't have. They're not walked down with the day-to-day -day work or meetings. We just go to them when we need some guidance. So for example, right now, uh, for, for the last few years, actually, we've been very involved in trying to find land and uh, buy land to build our own buildings and all that. So we have uh, we have our people who will be helping, within the church are helping us, a core team, but we also have an external advisor. So somebody, this person is not part of the church, but he actually was working for the government and he knows a lot. He, he was holding a big position here in Bangalore. So he knows a lot about the real estate. So he's been very involved, like just giving, you know, almost every other week I'll be talking to him to get guidance. And so we've gone and seen so many, Land, places and all of that. And so you know, he's always guiding us. So he's in like an advisor because he's an expert in that area. He knows. He'll tell us what is right, what is wrong, what are the requirements, what you should do, what you should not do, help us. So because we don't ourselves know everything. Similarly, we have a legal person. This legal person is also not part of the church. He's from outside. Uh, so whenever we need some guidance, we'll go to him. Uh, can we do this? Can we not do this? Because we don't know the law. Um, we have to go and ask him. And he will tell us, this is the law. This is how you can do, cannot go. Um, all the other people in all the other areas are people from within the church. There are people only in these two areas because we couldn't find qualified like people with that expertise from within the church. We are looking. We have people from outside the church. They go to a different church. They 
they have their own thing. But they give us advice. And it's not like we, uh, you know, we they have to attend meetings or anything. We can just talk to them yeah, and just say, hey, uh, this is a this is a situation. What is the right thing to do? And they'll give us advice, and we follow that. So, so having like this, an advisory board, meaning people who can give you guidance on special areas, is a good thing because the trustees may not know everything. The trustees know about the mission, they know about the ministry, they know about the vision, but they may not know about the accounting, the legal, other matters. So in those areas, you need, uh, it is good to get the input of experts, people who have knowledge. And that's why we call them as advisors. They're just there to give advice. And most of these people, actually all of these people, uh, uh, are not paid, the advisors, they're not paid. They just give because they want to. Only on the legal side, when we actually have to do paperwork, then the lawyer will charge us. So uh, when we have to do any legal work, paperwork, he will charge us for that. But just to ask some question, he, it's OK. He just freely gives us advice. But when it comes to actual work, that he has to file some papers, do that. Then he will do that for us, but he will charge us for that. So this is a good thing. It is not a requirement. It is just a nice thing to have. So I'm, so you can function without an advisory board. It's it's uh, it's perfectly fine. But it's a good thing to have when you when you have some people to go for advice. Any questions on that before we go forward? Let me check online as well. Any questions? Any questions from our class on what we've discussed so far? Okay. All right, let's move to the next lesson then. Yeah, go ahead. Uh-huh. Oh, one minute. So. Uh, sorry, uh, the or the PF, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, the uh, so the money that we have to give into the retirement fund. So how it works? It's a labor law that any organization, uh, any organization that has more than I uh, I forget the number, but I think it's uh, if you have more than twenty people as staff. You have to make sure that you open individual retirement accounts for these individuals. Now, the retirement account belongs to the individual. It's their account. But you have to help them open it. And then you have to contribute towards into those accounts as long as they are working in your organization. So it is a law. And I, I forget the exact number, but I think if you have more than 20 people working for your organization, then you have to set up retirement accounts for all your employees, and you have to contribute to them. Okay? And uh, the government specifies the percentage, the labor law. Um, again, I don't remember these numbers correctly. Um, so what happens is uh, when a new person joins, the or people's church. We ask them, do you already have a retirement account, a PF account? Uh, if they have been working before, most likely they will already have a PF account, uh, their, their retirement account. So we will just take that account, which is held with the government, and we will start giving, contributing to that every month. If they're a new person joining, like maybe a fresher, they may not have a PF account, then we will open it for them uh, with the government. And then every month we start contributing, whatever that percentage is. Basically, the way it works is you deduct some amount from their salary, and the organization contributes some amount, and that full amount is credited to their account as their retirement. And then they can take it out. Usually after they cross 60, they can take it out. 
and there are some provisions if they want to take it out earlier that's there are certain rules but it's a requirement so, example, yeah so um, uh, we will we will uh, yeah so we will talk about the human resources um the question is is there a law on fixing the salaries so there is no law right there is no saying that this role must be paid so much money there is no law from the government side so then so that becomes the question the question is then how as a church do we decide on the salaries of people so the way we do it is we base it on the skills and uh, role and responsibility uh, and the experience of the individuals so we decide we also look at the industry so what is the industry paying for a similar role now of course we cannot match the industry I and mean, the industry will always be higher you know the industry may be paying five times more you know especially if you're working for a big MNC and all that they will pay huge amounts for the same work for the same kind of role but we try to make sure that we pay good salaries we take care of them uh, based on their skills the role they're doing and the experience they bring based on that we will fix the salary uh, yeah. so we will talk about that when we come to human resources how do we fix the salaries but everybody is paid a fixed salary, staff or consultants. We will have to share with you how we do that. Okay, there's a question here on the chat. What happens to the offerings collected at the branch churches? Say if a pastor has seven, bran seven branches apart from the main church, how to keep account for that? Thank you. Okay, good question. So I will tell you how we were across. Uh, so we have right now. Um, like I said, I think 11 churches outside of Bangalore. And some of those churches themselves have branch churches. That means, example, Baloda Bazaar. There's one main church in Baloda Bazaar. But Baloda Bazaar also has two branch churches. So basically, there are three local churches there in the Baloda Bazaar area. We just count it as one church. Uh, similarly, um, uh, Kalyan, Kalyan has also started a branch in Mumbai, but we are just ca calling it one church, but actually there are two branches, so things like that. Now, the way we are functioning is we tell all, uh, 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 all except for APC Manglo, right? so APC Manglo, which is close to us, uh, functions almost like Bangalore, almost like, you know, uh, uh, an extended office of Bangalore. So, APC Bangalore, whatever tithes and offerings they get, they send it back to us here in Bangalore, and we account for that. Right? And they are directly paid. All the expenses of APC Bangalore is fully taken care of by APC Bangalore because we're pretty close to each other in terms of location, and we function as one entity. All the other churches, we tell them whatever money is given to them as tithes and offerings to keep it there and to use it as part of their expenses. So uh, whatever money they collect, they will put it into the, the bank account of uh, that particular church and they will use it for their own expenses. Plus every month we send money from Bangalore uh, to take care of some of the expenses in those locations. Basically, we will pay for the salaries of the pastors uh, and also sometimes uh, they rent buildings, the rent of the building. Uh, we will help them buy the equipment, all those things. So we send money from Bangalore to those local churches every month. Whatever they collect, they put it into their church bank accounts locally, and they use it there. It doesn't come back to Bangalore. Now, but they will send us accounts every month. So they will send us accounts saying, uh, this is the money we receive in tithes and offerings. 
uh, this is what we spent on rent or you know whatever they spend those accounts will come back to us so we know what is happening uh, the reason uh, we are doing that is the income in all these outreach churches is not much uh, some of them are in you know rural settings uh, income is very small so we just say you know just keep it there and use it there for anything any local expense that they may have so we don't take it back they just keep it and use it uh, that's how we work uh, does it help understand any questions uh, thank you Pastor. thank you all right any other questions from those in class okay all right okay there is um okay so there's another question uh, in the chat what if the pastor then in the branch which is having a secular job still should he get some support from the work that the pastor does okay um the way we operate is uh, all our pastors are 100 percent working for the church so they do not have any secular job uh, so we we discourage that i mean and in the sense we say you know you concentrate on the ministry uh, and we will give you enough to so that you can concentrate 100 percent on the ministry all your personal needs are taken care of so they don't need to work a secular job um the so that is the way we operate so all our outreach pastors uh, they just concentrate on the ministry and they get enough salary from us uh, to take care of their needs. What I have observed is, so I, I, we are not against, you know, by vocational pastors. We are not against, I myself uh, was, uh, you know, running my own business and pastoring of people's church till 2014. So till 2014, that is only, that's about nine years ago, uh, I was actually running my business and pastoring the church. Uh, I was not taking a salary from the church. So I was like a volunteer in the church, but my salary was coming from my business. In 2014, I moved and I uh, closed the business, concentrated on the church. So while I was doing it, uh, the way I did it was, I was not taking any money from the church. I was like a volunteer pastor running the church, but I was getting my salary from my own business. That's the way I was doing. And then when I changed, uh, I changed fully. Uh, that means now I'm a salaried staff of all people's church. So I get my salary from the church uh, and I'm focusing on the church. Now, what we have, and, and basically we like all our pastors to focus on the church. What we have observed was not everybody is able to balance the two. And even I can say from my own experience that it is not easy right, to run a business or do some work and pass to the church. I mean, at some point, both sides will be pulling you. It's not easy. I'm not saying it cannot be done. I did it for many, many years, uh, 14 years at ABC. Uh, and then before that, you know, when I was working in secular church. So I was able to do it, but when the ministry grows, then the, the, re the responsibility increases. Uh, people need your time. So um, uh, what I've observed, like uh, one, of, uh, one, of, one of the people, uh, that we were supporting, he started a business. So he he was pastoring a church, but he also started a business. Then what I noticed was his full attention was pulled into the business. Yeah. So it's not easy to balance the two. So we usually tell people just concentrate on do the ministry. We are not against doing a secular job. We know the Apostle Paul did it when he was traveling and he built tents and all that. Uh, but you need special grace to do that. 
God has to give you grace. And if God has called somebody to do that, that is fine. We're not against it. But generally, we just say, you know, you focus. And yeah. So if they're getting money from both sides, it's okay, but it has to be a fair thing. So if they're getting money from the work they're doing plus money from the church, it is okay. It's not bad. But it has to be the fair amount. I mean, if you're giving 20 hours a week for church, you get paid for 20 hours. If you're doing 20 hours secular job, you get paid for, the, for that money. So there's a fair uh, thing. Lyndon, you had a question? Okay. All right. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. Okay. Um, we will come. We have a separate chapter on human resources where we talk about all these details. We will discuss this again later. All right. Okay. Let me uh, go to the notes and we will go forward in uh, the next chapter. So, cha lesson number four is. Church and ministry organization structure. How do you organize the whole ministry? Right. So this is important because um, uh, this organization defines how the activities, you know, who does what. It defines that. It defines how information or decision making flows who's going to make the decisions right so we can't say hey guys all of you love jesus all of you are wonderful people just do what you want <laughs> it will be full chaos right uh, we can't just tell people just do what you want right so you can you know say 20 people come we're going to run a christian ministry uh it is we're going to run a church or we're going to run uh, uh, whatever kind of ministry. With 20 people, we're going to work together. All of you, pray. Do whatever you feel like. Get up in the morning, just pray. Whatever God tells you to do, do it. I mean, that is a good a good thing. Of course, we all have to pray. We all have to listen to God. But we have to be organized. We can't just tell, do what you need. Because then everybody, everybody will be confused. Who's going to do what? Who is responsible for making the decision? Who is going to, you know, take responsibility of various things? Be, that is not clear. So that is why we need to be very organized. We need an organizational structure. That means who is in which place? What is their role? What is their responsibility? What are the decisions they're supposed to make? What is the work they're supposed to do? So that is the organizational structure. Right. Example, we see the body. The body has structure. The eye is in a certain place. The eye is not in the toe. <laughs> if the eye was in the toe and we put on the shoe, the eye cannot see. <laughs> the eye is very important. It's in this place. It can see. Then the eye has a certain function. Ears have a certain function. Every part of our body is in a certain place. It has a certain function, but we all work to every part works together. And that's how the body functions. Similarly, the church or the Christian ministry, people have to have a certain place, role, responsibility, do your work, then everything will work together next week. Right? So um, when you are thinking about the ministry or the church, you have to think about how you want to organize it. And the, the who will be responsible? Mainly the leader of the ministry. That means it could be the pastor, the main pastor, or whoever is the leader, the vision bearer. They are the ones who will think and organize. In the you know down later on, once the organization grows, you can give that responsibility to different people or. Uh, you would, you would, you know, like a chief administrative officer, like somebody who is responsible for administration. But that will come later on. 
you know, because in the beginning, you will have a very small staff. You'll have two people, three people. You have to start small. So it is a pastor only who has to decide and make, you know, make these things. Then as the organization grows, you can give that responsibility to somebody else. That is fine. Okay. So very rarely you start big. We always usually start small. And so uh, we will have to grow over time. Now, generally speaking, there are four types of organizational structures. And we will explain, we will go through this. There is what we refer to as functional structure. That is what function each person is doing based on the function of the individual. You are youth pastor. You are children's pastor. You are worship pastor. You are uh, doing social, you're, you're responsible for social work. Right? So based on the function you're giving, you're creating a structure. Then there is divisional. You can think about this department. So you can create departments, music department, huh? uh, children's department. So it is similar to function. In a function, it is around a particular person. In a division, it is around a particular department. In that department, there will be many people. But you're creating departments, missions department, evangelism department, publications department, TV ministry. You know. So you, you, know, you can create many divisions. Sometimes the divisions can also be geographical. That means you, would, you say, okay, we are going to operate across India. We'll create divisions based on geography, north, south, east, west, central. So you have four or five uh, divisions. Right? I mean, you're looking, you're, you're looking at it from a, the divisional can be geographic. So one, the divisions could be along similar functions or ministries. Another, the division can be along geography. So North India, South India, East. So then you, within those divisions, you will have further as people who are responsible for everything. So you'll have, you know, uh, North India director or North India coordinator, South India coordinator. You, you'll give responsibility. But that could be another way to divide the work. Right? Then the structure could be a very flat structure. That means not too many levels. So senior pastor, pastors, ministry leaders, volunteers, and I will share what APC is doing, how our structure works, I'll share. Flat structure means there are not too many levels of hierarchy. Otherwise, there will be like, you know, somebody who is minister, then junior minister, senior minister, associate minister, vice president, whatever. so many levels. Now, if an organization is so big, you need so many levels, fine. But remember, the more levels you have, the longer it's going to take for making decisions. And uh, the more time it will take before something can be executed because if the senior person makes a decision it has to come all the way down somebody has to do the work so keep as far as possible keep it flat let me just one or two levels maximum three levels don't go beyond that okay. there's a senior leadership associates then all the others are there operating. So try to keep it as flat as possible. Yes, we need to have leadership and leaders, but keep it minimal. Only what is needed. So then things can happen very fast. Decision is made. The person is responsible, is informed, work is done. And otherwise, if we have three, four layers, 
somebody makes decision by the time the information gets down some weeks will go by before the work can even start so the point is try to keep it as flat as possible things can happen and uh, people can interact very very quickly with each other they don't have to feel oh i have to go and talk to somebody way up there no just just go talk make the decision do the work you know so now in a matrix structure there is a a mix of things right there is a mix of the functional structure and division uh, it's kind of intertwined so that uh, information people can interact very easily uh, and, and and flow flow easily together so these are just some examples of the types of structure that you would want to use right now like we said earlier the moment we start saying organizational structure some people say no oh, we don't want it. because you're becoming like the corporates corporations they have organized structure why are you bringing that into the church why you're saying church has to have organization structure people and roles and positions and responsibilities why are you bringing the world into the church? that's a mental block for many people to say this is wrong but actually we can start in the bible and in the bible you will find many places that like we said earlier people were organized god gave the idea to be organized to put people in places and that organized to organization helped the work of god take place and a classic example is in uh, the way david set up the tabernacle uh, i'll just give an introduction and uh, we will pick this up next week but you know when you think about the tabernacle of david uh, after he became king it, it was such a big task big task so what is what is the, what was the task he wanted prayer and worship to happen non stop so he said i have we will build the tabernacle but prayer the this must be running 24/7 non stop that was in david's heart prayer and worship must go to god 24/7 David didn't say okay people just come and worship keep worshiping god 24/7 no he organized the tabernacle i'll just give an introduction we'll look at we'll read the chapter in this so he had about 270 some worship leaders prophetic worship leaders then he had about 4000 musicians singers and musicians plus he had another 4000 we would call them as attenders they are taking care of all the work in the tabernacle they just you know cleaning doing this doing that so think about it. totally more than 8000 people working 8200 some people and these were all paid people they were paid by the kingdom so imagine this is like a big corporation big organized multinational corporation <laughs> more than 8000 people are working in the tabernacle they are paid people paid stuff what was the objective we have to have prayer and worship happening 24/7 non stop it must be happening. prayer worship sacrifices people are coming all so many things are happening this must go on 24/7 that is the object so it's a very spiritual object right worship god non stop 
pray and worship non-stop. But to make that happen, he had more than 8,000 staff working. And very detailed organization. Very de We will read it in scripture. Very detailed. Who must do what? Uh, like a timetable. Put. So people are very clear. They know this person is leading worship. These people are leading worship. These are the singers. This is the time of day they will come and be doing the responsibility. So, because he, he organized in such a way, for 33 years, prayer and worship happened in the tabernacle of David. So, so think about it. 33 years, just confirm. While he was king, during his reign, worship was happening. Prayer and worship was going on nonstop. So, we will look at this next week, where... There's a spiritual mission, but good organization actually helped that to happen. He made it happen. Okay. So we'll pick this up next week. We will close in prayer. Are there any questions? Okay. All right. Could one of us uh, close in prayer? We'll pick this up next week. Continue. Let's pray. Our loving Father, once again, Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for uh, speaking to us, Lord, through your servant, Lord, continuously. I pray that as we all are learning about church and ministry administration, Lord, you bless us. And Lord, let our learning be a, a blessing to all of us, Master. Continuously, I pray for next class, Lord, as we all are preparing for. I pray that, Lord, you bless us uh, and uh, prepare heart and minds and soul, Lord. So thank you once again for each of one of life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, see you again next week. I will put the uh, sample trust deed on the classwork. Okay. See you all. God bless. Bye.